Dr. Napier, just a, a handful of further questions on, on various miscellaneous topics and, and issues arising from your evidence so far. Can I ask you, first of all, to look at NHBT 40188 underscore 054? This is a letter from you, 18th of September 1989, uh, to Mr. Peter Gregory in the NHS Directorate at the Welsh Office. And we can see it's about autologist transfusion. Um, um, can you just explain for us, first of all, what that is? Yes, indeed. There are, autologous transfusion is when you donate your own blood for storage and retransfusion at a time when you need it. And this could be done in two ways. Um, the, the simplest to understand way is uh, you, you attend and give, say, a pint or a pack of blood um, once a week until you've collected, say, three or four units of blood. And, uh, and then they're, they're stored, in fact, rather less time than that, they're stored um, prior to um, uh, planned surgery. So uh, if you're awaiting a surgical procedure in which blood is expected to be used, you'd have collect collected a small amount of your own blood ready for um, reinfusion if you should need it um, at the time of surgery. The uh, problem with that is that uh, it doesn't permit cancellation of your surgery. Once your blood is collected, you basically, you've got to, you, once you started, you've got to carry on. So it's a little inflexible in that respect. The uh, other procedure is, uh, it's a bit like um, plasmapheresis. You get uh, attached to a machine, and this is something that's usually done in procedures such as cardiac surgery, when all the blood that is lost during the surgery is uh, is uh, sucked up into the machine and is washed. So the red cells are washed and then they can be reinfused um, as you're going along. So in, in fact, it's a salvage procedure. The blood that you're losing because of the surgery is, is not lost as it might otherwise be. It's it's cleaned up in the machine and it's reinfused when you need it. So this is a, a technique known as self, uh, cell salvage, uh, um, uh, autologous transfusion. And to what extent was autologous transfusion in, in either um, uh, method uh, in, in use in the Cardiff Centre during the time that you were medical director? Well, very little. We did establish a, a small locus for offering autologous transfusion. Um, we did that because um, the alternative was um, that hospitals should do it themselves. Well, they don't necessarily have um, staff who are trained in the, the safe ways of blood collection and retransfusion. And so it seemed better that if, uh, if it was to be offered locally, then it would be done by staff who um, were trained and, and ex expert in the safe procedure. Um, but it's, it has its constraints. It does obviously have to demand a commitment from the donor that they turn up the right, right number of times to uh, um, donate and store their donations. It also has the logistic problem that um, it commits the surgeons um, to operating on that day. Otherwise, the collections are, will expire and will go to waste. So it, it does have constraints and is, and is a, a bit inflexible. But we did offer that because uh, at the time there was a concern about the safety of, um, of conventional transfusion. I mean, there always are um, episodes in which perhaps uh, someone has contracted an infection from transfusion and uh, there's anxiety about the safety of blood transfusion. And but the, the public perception is that if you collect blood from yourself, at least you should be safe from those problems. That's not entirely true because um, blood can be contaminated during its collection if it's not collected in the highest possible aseptic standard. 
and you can get an, an, an infected pack and that consequence of that could be disastrous. You also have to have a very practiced discipline to ensure that it's labeled correctly and that when you come to be given your own blood back, it's your own blood back that you get given and not um, because of the labeling error, um, something else. Um, so uh, um, it, it's not, it, it's arguable as to whether or not it's safer the, or, or, than the alternative. I think if it's done by well-trained operators, then it's a safe procedure, but it is, it is, as I say, inflexible, and the very fact that it's done on a relatively small scale means it's, a, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's a more costly procedure. We, we did this to address the concerns that people may have about um, the safety of donated blood and to offer an outlook of, if people felt strongly that they needed, wanted to have the option of uh, their own blood reinfusion. Um, I, it, it didn't continue for long because it, I think interest in it waned when people realised the, um, the, the uh, constraints that I mentioned. I think uh, enthusiasm waned and I don't think the procedure, the uh, facility carried on for very long. But uh, um, so that's the pre-donation form of autologous transfusion. The alternative cell salvage um, did uh, have an established use in the sorts of major surgery where very large amounts of blood loss um, was expected, and so that that was accepted as a as a um, a very worthwhile alternative to. Uh, relying entirely on donated blood and it did also have the the, uh, the uh, a, a advantage that um, you weren't relying on the availability of blood from the blood transfusion service um, you um, uh, as I said you were salvaging the blood that was lost during surgery and uh, there weren't the anxieties then about um, labeling because the blood although it left your body it, it's a uh, was processed within the machine, which was sat by um, next to you in the operating theatre. So there was no doubt that you were going to get your own blood back. There are other technical problems that might arise, but by and large, um, the instrumentation and the technique became very sophisticated and safe and relatively efficient. Although, of course, the equipment is uh, expensive and it's a, a fairly expensive alternative to uh, conventional transfusion practice. Uh, can, can I just then draw your attention um, in the third paragraph of the letter just to a general observation you made and then I want to take you to another document and ask you about it. So in the third paragraph, second line, you say the risk of transmitting significant viral illness through blood transfusion is very small but is nevertheless greater than the zero risk of using autologous blood. And then you say this, what is of course changing is perception of the acceptability of risk levels and you make a reference next to the new product liability legislation. Dr Nape, if you can just hold in your mind that idea of changing perception of the acceptability of risk, I'm going to show you one other document and then ask you about that. So if we could go to NHBT four zeros, no sorry, five zeros, four four underscore zero nine five. This is a short discussion paper authored by Dr. Contreras and Dr. Barbara, January 1992. The context here is routine anti-HBC screening of blood donations. And if we look at the first paragraph, I'm, I'm not asking you specifically about anti-HBC screening, Dr. Napier. Um, in the first paragraph, picking it up in the third line, the authors say this, the attitude towards transfusion safety has veered away from the concept of maximum benefit at minimal cost towards the notion that if a procedure shown to prevent transfusion, transmitted infection and disease is available, it should be introduced. The latter approach is reinforced by loss of crown immunity, the introduction of product liability and the emphasis on quality audit and licensing by the Medicines Control Agency. Now, seemed to me, Dr Napier, that what was being said here is something that's not dissimilar to what you were talking about when you used the concept of the changing perception of the acceptability of risk. 
Can I ask whether you have any observations upon what's described here about there being a shift in attitude towards transfusion safety over the years? Well, it, it's hard to comment. I, th I think the goal of transfusion centres is towards um, uh, minimising and uh, uh, aiming for zero risk. But any risk reduction strategy has to be justified or defended against the cost implications. And those cost implications in the wider debate amongst health authorities will be a trade-off. Well, if we spend the money on this form of uh, risk reduction and patient safety, um, are we not spending on some other area of healthcare which um, might be even more beneficial in terms of sa sa uh, for patient safety? So I, I think there's a, an argument and a balance here that has to be struck. I mean, uh, as far as we're concerned in transfusion, I think uh, the stance we take is we press to do as much as we can um, to prevent transfusion to mitig transfusion to mitig transmission risk. I'm sorry, um, but we have to sort of reflect on whether our arguments, the resources, are likely to be sympathetically received. Um. Can I then um, ask you now to look at a letter you wrote on the question of whether there should be a look-back exercise? I'm not going to ask you about the detailed mechanics of the look-back exercise that was undertaken, um, Dr Napier, because we have other witnesses who we can ask about that. But if we look at NHBT 011 This is a letter that you wrote in September 1994 to Dr. Alla, or Alla um, at the Regional Transfusion Centre in Birmingham. Um, many thanks for sending a copy of the preliminary position paper on the Look Back programme for HCV-infected recipients. It seems to me that the commending feature of such a policy should be the amount of benefit identified patients get from any treatment they may be given. We would have to bear in mind that by now such patients would be mature in their post-infection phase and consider the likely efficacy of treatment at that phase. I have two other thoughts which do not constitute moral contraindications, but I wonder how much they were considered by your group. Firstly, is this policy likely to uncover a large number of potential litigants, in which case both ourselves and the Department of Health will have to be braced for the repercussions? Secondly, and partly as a consequence, the transfusion service may have to be prepared for a wave of adverse publicity if we learnt, for example, that many thousands of transfused patients have been HCV infected and have become ill as a result. Obviously, if there is good evidence that we can offer treatment that would, in the patient's terms, be worthwhile, we should do it. If that is not the case, there is a strong chance that we will produce a very large amount of anxiety for patients and their families which they would not thank us for. And top of the next page... I am sure your group's deliberations have covered these points, but I don't think they were recorded in the minutes. I'm not sure whether the decision to pursue this policy is entirely a medical or scientific one, but it may additionally require medical ethical input. Benefits of action which may make us feel better or inaction seem to be fairly evenly balanced. If, if we can go back to the first page... Is it right to understand that your view, as at September 1994, Dr Napier, was that a look back should only be undertaken if there was good evidence that worthwhile treatment could be offered to patients who had hepatitis C? Well, I'm not sure that I had a firm view. I was just anxious that all the implications would be considered. And I think individual people would have uh, different points of view about this. Some people would feel that patients have to be told, or they might wish to be told themselves, uh, whatever uh, hope could be offered in terms of remedial treatments. Uh, um, other people take the opposite view. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which point of view I would take, but since I hadn't been at the meeting, and I wasn't so obviously knowledgeable about um, the arguments that have been floated around that, uh, uh, that, that led to this, uh, this uh, proposal, I just wrote the letter just to say, well, you know, these are th thoughts that come to my mind. Um, have, have they been, uh, been considered by the, uh, the, the position paper working group? W would you... 
would, would you accept that there should be on uh, as part of the decision making exercise a very substantial weight indeed given to the the ethical or moral imperative that people should be entitled to know if they have been infected with a serious disease as a result of their medical treatment? I don't know that answer, and I think um, individual people will have their own responses, and they won't all, some people want to know um, everything, and some people don't want to know, and if perhaps um, there are situations in which um, the choices are between a, a, a prolonged period of anxiety with nobody being able to give you any treatment or reassurance on one hand, or, um, or I use the rather glib term, blissful ignorance. I'm not sure which is the option. Different people have different approaches, and I don't know what the answer is. My point of writing the letter was just to say, well, you know, I, I hope these things have been talked about. Would you accept that, um, leaving aside the question of what the current medical treatment was at that point in time for hepatitis C, um, with a condition such as hepatitis C, it may be very important for an individual to know that they have been infected. First of all, because they may be able to make lifestyle adjustments that would have a real impact on their health. And secondly, because they would be able to ensure that they were regularly screened and followed up and um, checked for uh, cirrhosis uh, um, or, or development of hepatocellular cancer? Yes, I, I accept that. My point of writing the letter to say, well, I was really asking, have, have, have these factors have been considered because they're not brought out in this letter? What, why would either the prospect of litigation or adverse publicity be relevant at all? Well, only in so far as um, we, ha the, we would have to be prepared for it and not be taken off, uh, off guard, so to say. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not proposing that this, uh, these factors should be discouraging what was proposed. It's just to say, well, you know, that this may well happen. We, we would think about it and... Uh, and some thought towards um, how we handle these problems. Uh, um, the, the next document then, Dr Napier, on a completely different topic, HSOC 0004692. Um, if we go to the third page... It, this is a letter written by you on the 24th of September 1987, and if we look at the bottom of the page, um, we can see it says, copies to all MPs in regions served by Welsh Regional Transfusion Service, Mr John Moore, Mr Peter Walker, Mrs Margaret Thatcher. And then what you said in the substance of the letter is, you'll no doubt be aware that the National Blood Transfusion Service has recently been the centre of a certain amount of publicity. This publicity has in particular highlighted the shortcomings of the service with regard to supply of NHS blood products, which have in turn led to a need for imported commercial blood products. You may also be hearing shortly that the Haemophilia Society is launching a campaign for recompense on behalf of the numerous patients with haemophilia who became infected as a result of using infected commercial blood products. I hope you will personally add your support to this campaign. We must recognise that had there been greater resolve on the part of central government over the last two decades to assist the transfusion service in becoming self-sufficient, these unfortunate episodes would not have occurred. It is, of course, appreciated that the advent of AIDS as a transfusion hazard could not have been foreseen. Nevertheless, there have always been sound medical and ethical arguments against the importation of blood products. These views have indeed for many years been endorsed by the World Health Organization. Um, Dr Napier, two questions. Firstly, do, do you recall whether you ever received a response from any of those to whom you'd addressed this letter? Um, I expect I did, but as, as I said, I, I don't have access to my files and correspondence at that time. I'm sure I did in some, but almost certainly not all of them. And um, I, I have some recollections of, of support, but I can't go further than that. It's so long ago, and I, as I said, I don't have the paperwork to to help me. And then in relation to the second paragraph, you talked about how, had there been greater resolve on the part of central 
government over the last two decades to assist the transfusion service in becoming self-sufficient, um, uh, you, you say this could have been avoided. Um, what in particular did you have in mind when you wrote this letter that could or should have been done by central government that, that wasn't? Well, the, uh, increasing the capacity and upgrading the development of the bioproducts laboratory to, pers to process and handle all the plasma that was necessary to, really, to uh, achieve self-sufficiency targets and also some mechanism for resourcing the local collection of the, the donations or plasma for uses donations that would uh, provide the plasma that was needed. Okay, thank you. We can take that down. D Dr. Napier, I've just now got a handful of questions that I've been asked to uh, ask of you by core participants to the inquiry. Um, the, the first is in relation to the, the AIDS leaflets and the method of distribution. You said it wasn't possible to include the leaflets in the call-up mailings due to the computer system. Um, could I just ask you, oh, or I'm asked to ask you to explain why it wasn't possible, for example, to include the leaflet in envelopes being sent with the call-up notifications? What, what was it about the computer system that prohibited a, a, a mail shot of the leaflets, in other words? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't answer that very well. It is, was a mechanised process. In other words, it wasn't a, a single person packing a, leaf, um, uh, a letter into an envelope and sealing it. I think there was uh, um, a, a completely automated process that uh, generated each letter. So it, there was no manual intervention at that stage. Okay. So it wouldn't have been a step if it was possible to put an insert in. Uh, I, I can't, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a long time ago and I've got no clear recollection of the, of the mechanics of it now. Next question is this. Um, did you ever have discussions with the Welsh office or, or with Dr Crompton regarding the desirability of achieving self-sufficiency in blood products in Wales as distinct from the United Kingdom? So a, a Welsh national policy of self-sufficiency. Well, I didn't. Um, I'm not sure how that would have been achieved because we would have to... Uh, uh, get some assurances from the uh, uh -huh. Blood Products Laboratory that they would handle the Welsh plasma separately and give a guarantee that all the Welsh plasma could be handled. And this may have an impact on their capacity to deal with plasma from other centres. So I don't recall, I'm sure I never had that discussion with uh, the Chief Medical Officer, and I don't think we'd achieve much mileage out of it. I think that the, the attitude was that we were all working together as regions of England and Wales in this effort. If the regional health authority had provided funding to um, expand the regional transfusion centre to allow for increased plasmapheresis, um, could the regional transfusion centre at Cardiff have provided enough plasma for fractionation, whether that was at BPL or PFC? to allow sufficient production of factor eight to meet the demand in the South Wales region? I, I'm not, I, I, I find it hard to answer that. I, we, I imagine that um, if we had been resourced to produce the requisite amount of plasma, then um, we would have to be ensure that there was a sort of pro rata of distribution of finished product back to Cardiff. I, in that case, I think perhaps we might have been self-sufficient as far as Wales is concerned. But the other dimension to this is that uh, Cardiff is, was a regional centre for haemophilia treatment, and I, I don't know what the geographical boundaries of that are, but it might mean that it treated patients from outside Wales and so I don't think we were looking at it with particular regional spectacles at, at that time. It was, I think, a joint England and Wales effort. Um, next question um, requires us to look back at your, the Lancet letter of March 1985 on HTLB3 testing. So that's PRSE 0004824, please show me. And if we go to the second page, and if we just zoom in on that letter in the right-hand column, 
it's a little further down. So um, the letter that was co-signed by you and a number of other directors says in the first sentence, we believe that the current commercial kits for HTLV3 antibody tests are likely to give a high rate of false positive results. Um, and, and the question, Dr. Napier, I'm asked to ask you was, what was the basis for the belief that it was likely that the HTLV3 test carried a high rate of false positives when you didn't have a confirmatory test to assess the rate of false positives? Uh, I think these first generation tests were being evaluated by a microbiological expert group and who would have uh, drawn their conclusions their, from their ability to do their own confirmatory tests. I, I can't speak to technical or scientific details um, from this point in time, but I think, I think the wording of this probably derives from the information that we've got from the preliminary evalu evaluation of tests by the uh, expert advisory groups. I can't go beyond that. I think we certainly understood that international experience was showing a high rate of false positive results. We can take that down. Thank you, Shane. Um, you talked in your evidence earlier about the uh, importance of, of testing being introduced uniformly by all regional transfusion centres. Um, we know that Dr. Lloyd introduced second generation hepatitis C testing in 1991, several months prior to other centres. And it's my understanding that there were three centres which introduced anti-HBC testing unilaterally. Do you accept that it was in principle open to regional transfusion centres to unilaterally introduce testing, provided that they had the sufficient funding? I, I think that is the case. But an underlying principle of the UK transfusion service is to, is to agree common standards for achieving maximum blood safety and to, to resist the temptation for fragmentation and different practices arising um, throughout um, England, Wales and Scotland. Um, the fact that at times centres broke ranks I think doesn't detract from the underlying aspiration shared by most people that we should aim for the highest standards and implement them uniformly. Um, the, the last questions I, I have, Dr. Napier, arise out of uh, your, your evidence relating to prevalence of I in infections in the community um, in relation to non-A, non-B hepatitis, hepatitis C. Um, what, what was the source of your information regarding the prevalence of infections in the community served by the Welsh Regional Transfusion Centre? There had been studies... Um, not in Wales, but in the, in the rest of the United Kingdom. I can't reference them now because obviously you've just uh, presented me the question, but I, I, I would have seen studies showing the prevalence, HCV prevalence of, that have been conducted in parts of the UK. Uh, was it your understanding that there were different levels of infection within different regions of, or parts of the UK? I don't know that for sure. I think it's possible there might have been perhaps certain areas of, of uh, metropolitan London I, I mean uh, I think we would perha uh, perhaps uh, relate the general level of infectivity to areas where perhaps uh, intravenous drug abuse was most prevalent that doesn't of course necessarily mean that the donor population would reflect that but there might be differences in different parts of the UK dependent on um, the, the uh, extensive intravenous drug abuse throughout the country and I, I, I don't have any particular knowledge about that but I'm surmising that is the case. L last question um, is this on, on, on the similar topic. Before any test is introduced um, how can you be sure about the prevalence of infection whether that's HTLV3 or hepatitis C in the community particularly given the recognised lag between infection and development of symptoms? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the yes. question again? I, I can. It's a question I've been asked to ask, so it's not my own precise formulation. Before any test is introduced, so when you, when you haven't yet introduced the test, how can you um, 
be confident you know the prevalence of infection, whether hepatitis or HIV, in the community, particularly given the, 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 the delay, the incubation period between infection and development of symptoms? Well, one, one of the markers would be the, uh, the prevalence of established disease, and obviously AIDS, man, AIDS manifests itself as a very severe illness, and you know, knowledge of the incidence of AIDS cases um, would be uh, gained throughout the United Kingdom. Um, and from that, there might be inferences as to the numbers of asymptomatic cases that could be about. There will be a few uh, survey studies of um, of uh, populations to gauge the uh, the extent of infection amongst the population. Um, there is information gathered from other clinical sources with regard to hepatitis C um, pa patients with um, established end stage liver disease, whether or, whether they were or not HCV infected, and how they might have acquired the HCV infection. So there are other indications from either surveys or medical sources which give some indication as to the state of play with regard to these infections. So those are the questions from core participants that I was proposing to ask. Do you have any questions for Dr Napier? Uh, I, 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 I do just have, have one, which is, um, it really goes back to a, a question you were asked after you were taken to CBLA Three zeros one nine zero five. Now I can't remember which page that you you took. We go to the Napier next to. page. Yeah. Um, we go over. Is this in relation to AIDS, sir? Uh... Um, I, I think it was before then. It was. Let me tell you what the what the point was, so that you can you can just help me with this. Uh, there was a concern expressed uh, about the, the way in which blood donations were were taken, uh, and whether there might be legal claims in respect of blood donation by by blood donors. Uh, and it, I just wondered. Uh, how many times, if at all, the answer may simply be none, uh, were, uh, in, in your knowledge, were there claims by, made by donors arising out of the way in which their blood had been taken at blood donation sessions? There is a, a risk um, if during donation that... Um, for technical reasons, there might be injury to the vein or the arm, and very occasionally donors would have a very substantial bruise and a considerable period of discomfort. The, the practice of the, the Welsh Centre, and I imagine others, was as soon as we learnt of that episode, we would send the doctor out to see the donor um, to explain what had gone wrong and apologise for it. And in that way, I think um, almost always the donor was happy that they had that consideration. And I, I'm, I'm not sure that I can recall any donor wishing to take it further in terms of litigation. I'm not saying that didn't happen, but I, I don't recall it happening. So, uh, I, and again, following on from, from that, was it uh, generally the, the practice for uh, the, the nurse or, or the medical officer attending a transfusion, a, a uh, donation session, uh, to tell the, the would-be donor uh, this this may cause discomfort. Just very rarely, it, it may cause a bit more than that. You may have bruising or, or some some reaction. I I, I don't. Again, I, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think that would have been said at, at, at every single donor attendance. Um, I, I'm I, I'm not in, entirely sure how much of that dialogue would have taken place. Um, we did expect um, these to be very rare instances, and I, I think if um, if things seem to have been 
if it seemed to be difficult during donation, I think that would be the time in which people would have explained that there could be um, a complication arising from it. But I'm not sure that every donor was warned. And again, I'm not, you know, too long, I can't remember what was routine practice in terms of warning donors about, um, uh, about these sort of problems. Right, well, th th that's all that I ask. Thank you very much. And so for the transcript, the passage about litigation was in the context of the discussion about the medical staffing of donor sessions, page four of that. Thank you. Yes, um, where, where litigation was uh, anticipated and, and it was something taken into consideration. I just wondered, uh, really, generally, how defensive the service was. And that, that was the, uh, the, um, the thinking behind my, my asking the question. But thank you very much. Yes. Dr Napier, um, Ms Palliser, I should say, has confirmed she doesn't have any um, questions. Um, D Dr Napier, is there anything further you would wish to add? Um, there are just a few observations, if I may. I, well, firstly, can I thank you for your courtesy in the way this um, interview has been conducted. It's, uh, I do very much appreciate that. Um, I would just like raise one concern about communication with the uh, uh, witnesses such as myself. Um, I understand perfectly the reason for delay a fortnight ago, but um, I was very fortunate that a colleague at the Welsh Blood Service telephoned me late that evening to say, you know, the, the hearing won't take place tomorrow. I, I didn't have a communication directly from the inquiry team, and um, had I not fortunately had that um, telephone call from this colleague, and I not had my and also that I had my mobile phone switched on at the time. Had that not been the case, I would have turned up to an inquiry that didn't take place. And secondly, I don't, I, I've looked carefully, I didn't have any direct communication with regard to the resumption of the hearing yesterday and today. Fortunately, the same colleague um, texted me to give me um, some with wishes for the, uh, this interview. And I said, well, this is, the only news I've had that the interview is taking place. I, I, I had other plans for yesterday and today, and had she not been in touch with me, I, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't have been here. So I'm just thinking about um, anticipating that avoiding future difficulties with other witnesses, because I think something seems to have gone amiss in terms of the security of communication with such as myself. It would be a great shame if um, your time and efforts were being wasted by my non-appearance. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to uh, make that point. Um, if I could just, you know, for my, this whole process has given me more time to reflect in a number of years after I was at work on uh, whether things could have been any different. I personally, I, I regret the fact that I was perhaps slow to understand the potential seriousness of uh, hepatitis C in transfusion. It did for a while have um, the title of a transaminase or transaminitis. That's basically a, a sort of term used to describe transient elevation of uh, the enzyme showing liver damage. And I think it took it, it took quite a while for the pieces of jigsaw puzzle to come together to realise this was part of a chronic, extremely serious, and devastating illness. I think my personal perspective, regret being slow to realize it's significant as far as transfusion, but it did seem to me that the link between the people studying patients with serious end-stage liver disease and linking that with a possible transfusion history was slow to be made. And also a further uh, uh, difficulty in uh, realizing this link is of course that many transfused patients are you know, perhaps being treated for cancer or late on in their life and may actually not live long enough to demonstrate this, the, the chronic end-stage liver disease. And perhaps in the early years, they wouldn't have any signs of illness. So I think it took longer for the penny to drop as far as um, the significance of non-A, non-B hepatitis as far as transfusion is concerned. Um, going back to what could have been done better, You'll see from the correspondence, uh, many people in transfusion service were desperate that the UK should be self-sufficient in terms of its plasma procurement and production of products. Um, 
And I think had we been so, it seems quite likely we would have avoided the worst of the HIV. Um, it, 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 perhaps not entirely, but I think we had advanced warning about how desperate things were in the United States. And if we'd had enough of our own blood products and no need to import things, that maybe we, the UK would have got along much better than it did with regard to uh, HIV transmission. I'm not certain what the position is with regard to non-A, non-B hepatitis, because um, it seems to me that uh, with the prevalence rate, of, admittedly very low, something like one in every 200 or one in every 500, that many haemophilia patients with whatever their mode of treatment would have had enough donor exposures to mean it would be a, they would be very lucky not to have um, managed to uh, acquire non-A, non-B hepatitis. So I don't think the self-sufficiency argument uh, impacts nearly as much on uh, on the, uh, the appearance of non-A, non-B hepatitis. And of course, this is all at a time that predates uh, effective uh, viral inactivation. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think uh, you, we do regret the fact that um, we weren't self-sufficient of blood products, but I, I don't think that prevented all the disasters that we very much regret took place. My, my final aspect is that um, this has been very upsetting for everybody in transfusion, and um, but I'm thinking in particular that uh, transfusion isn't just the professionals that we've been talking about in these inquiries. Uh, transfusion is also millions of blood donors and many thousands of volunteers who help with recruitment and organization of uh, transfusion sessions. And all those people are giving their best efforts for the benefit of society and, uh, and uh, mankind. And I feel it would be a great shame if they felt their efforts were being tarnished by these tragedies that we've been hearing about in this in inquiry. And that, that's my, my last anxiety, that whatever the outcome of this is, that we still do um, not damage the atmosphere of support that we get from the volunteer community, uh, and that's for the sake of our transfusion services in, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Napier. Sir, Sir Brian. Uh, well, I, I think it, just on that last point, if, if anything, um, your, your uh, evidence uh, uh, about the importance of self-sufficiency would have encouraged those donors who have themselves for no money at all uh, and at a little risk to themselves uh, given a donation of blood to someone who is always going to be and always was a complete stranger to them just for the sake of doing good to somebody else. Um, and that, I, I suspect, uh, will remain uh, for those who give blood uh, the, the reason that they do it and will continue to do it. Uh, and I wouldn't have thought that they would be put off by us ensuring that their blood is used to the very best uh, as a country, as far as we can for the future, uh, for the very best of others. Um, can I just deal with the, the my, my apologies? However it came about uh, for your not knowing uh, of the change of, uh, of date uh, and for your understanding um, and your, your lack of, of being intemperate about the, the changes, I, I can well understand you, you might have had. I, I don't know if it was the inquiry's fault in communicating because the communication would have been through your, your lawyers, um, uh, uh, those representing you, or, or not. Uh, but however it happened, uh, I'm sorry that you were put to that. Uh, and it's part of the the problems that you, you've had, in a sense, in giving evidence, because you've, you've been able to give us, actually, a remarkable picture, despite the difficulties that what you've been describing happened, in many cases, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you have not had access to your uh, original papers through no fault of your own. They simply aren't there to be accessed. Uh, and they would have helped the answering a, a number of questions. And I fully understand uh, that you can't now uh, recall, as you 
often couldn't, um, the precise way in which the arguments went and the details of which uh, council has been pressing you about, uh, and uh, we've wanted to know. But what you have been able to show us, um, as I've said, is the context within which you operated, and you've made it very clear uh, the importance to the transfusion service of the donor, uh, and you've filled in some of the gaps and helped me uh, and the inquiry generally to understand uh, how a number of the, the arguments fit uh, with the picture as it was in those days. And for that, uh, I'm very grateful indeed. And for your time, uh, it's two days it is a longish period of time, particularly at short notice. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's, uh, we resume tomorrow with the evidence of Professor Contreras. Yes, Professor Contreras, then 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.